Uh -huh. All right. Okay. Um, so again, sermon on the mount. Um, we are in the section now where Christ has said in five twenty that unless your deeds uh, exceed that of the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom of God. And now he's in a successive series of examples of different ways in which the Pharisees in misinterpreted the law and God's intent and what true righteousness means. So we've talked about murder, and we've talked about adultery, and we've talked about uh, divorce. And so, again, just to kind of set the context, the reason why Jesus is picking these specific things is because they provide the audience a very clear example of what unrighteousness looks like. In other words, what the Pharisees believed when they read the Old Testament law that God gave Moses, they interpreted it one way, which is in unrighteousness. They misinterpreted God's intention in the law. They misinterpreted what God wanted people to be like when he gave the law. Christ then is saying, but I say, showing what God's true intention was for these laws. So he's not meaning to give a dissertation on these topics. He's not meaning to say everything about anger or about divorce or you know, about adultery, even things like that. He's trying to just provide quick evidential examples from the law to show how the Pharisees, who are actually in the crowd, by the way, how they have misinterpreted the righteousness of God's law compared to what God intended. Does that all make sense? Okay, so we are now in the next one, which is the law of oaths. And we find Jesus then saying, again, we ended up with divorce last, last week, and now we're, uh, in, now we're in the law of oaths. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let uh, what uh, you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. All right. Now, um, oath-taking was actually allowed in the Mosaic Law, right? Now, the reason for oath taking the Mosaic law was for a person to be able to assert the certainty of a particular action or an agreement, right? That's what it was about. So, for instance, we go back and there's quite a few of these. If you read uh, um, Exodus, I, I think 24, 25, 26, something like that, anywhere somewhere around the mid to late 20s, um, there's, there's quite a few examples of oath taking. Right. And what not to do. So so there's there's a lot of this going on where God actually in the Mosaic law said, hey, this is what oath taking should look like. So when Christ is saying you shouldn't take an oath, we have to keep in mind how the Pharisees took the Mosaic law. And what they did with it to understand why Christ is saying that, because clearly if the Mosaic law said you could take oaths, but you had to do it in a certain way then Christ can't be contradicting the Mosaic law and saying it's not true because then he would be going against every jot and tittle of the Mosaic law. So when he says don't take an oath, we have to understand what is his intention in that saying. Does that all make sense? Good so far? All right. So Numbers 31 through 2 says, Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes, this is just an example, to the tribes of the people of Israel saying, this is what the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So again, God didn't prohibit you from making an oath to swear to do something, right? But it says that if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge to some other individual, then what? Don't break it. And so when you read the Old Testament law about oaths, it actually has, um, there's quite a few instances where it talks about not taking oaths uh, in a rash manner. Right? Don't just be, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Or no, I, I swear, I swear I'll take care of that. Or no, I swear I'll do it. In other words, 
if you took a vow according to the Mosaic law, you were bound to keep it. So be very careful what you swear an oath to do. That all make sense? That's what you get from the Mosaic law is rash oaths or rash promises or vows are a no-no, right? Um, and again, we see that in Leviticus, just another area. In fact, if you could just go back and read, you know, Exodus through Deuteronomy, you'll see this, you know, throughout uh, those, those books. Leviticus 5, uh, 4 through 6 says, Or if anyone utters with his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good, any sort of rash oath that people swear, and it is hidden from him, when he comes to know it and he realizes his guilt in any of these, when he realizes his guilt in any of these and confesses the sin he has committed, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for his sin. Now, what this is saying here is sometimes there are oaths that we make that we're like, we know exactly what we're doing. We're very intentional with that. They're very binding. Like many of you, when you got married, you made a vow, right? Really intentional, hopefully not rash. Hopefully you weren't in Vegas and you just wound up before a you know, preacher someplace and, you know the Elvis Hotel or whatever. But what I'm saying is there are some we do, but Leviticus even says, hey, you got to be careful not to make a rash statement of, yeah, I'll take care of that. Y'all go do that. Because guess what? You've now made a commitment. And even if you forgot about it, or you were just kind of like, yeah, I'm just saying that to get rid of the person, or whatever the case might be, God doesn't look at it that way. He takes your word when you say you are going to do X and holds you accountable to it. So in the Mosaic law, if you even forgot that, oh, yeah, I promised so-and-so to do this. I vowed to them and swore an oath, and yeah, maybe it was just rash, and I totally forgot about it because it wasn't a big deal to me. God says, no, it's a big deal. You made, a, you made an oath to somebody, and it was sin. Like, we like to take our oath-taking as human frailty, right? I'm just human. I forget, you know, whatever. That's this whole thing right here. And God says, no, no, no. Hold on. Be careful when you promise someone, I will or I will not do X. Okay, God considered that sin, not human frailty. Does that all make sense? All right. Now, it doesn't mean that we human frailty is coming to play where we do, truly do forget some stuff. But the point is, is you don't make those kind of statements without meaning to carry them forth. Okay. All right. Um, now, in the Jewish writings, they had these three separate words, and we, we're not going to go into uh, the, the differences um, to them. We will get into the one uh, uh, called uh, Korban. There's Harem, Nazir, and, and Korban. We will get into Korban later on when we talk about how the uh, Pharisees were deceptive in wanting to keep their own money and not care for their aging parents. So according to the Mosaic law, you're supposed to take care of your aging parents, right? And they would say, Korban, devoted. Like it's devoted to God, Korban, devoted to God. My money, I'm sorry, I can't do anything with it. It's devoted to God. I wish mom and dad I could take care of you, but guess what? It's all God's. But what it really meant is I'm just keeping it all for myself and do whatever I want with it, right? That was that was the thing. So they had these 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 words that they used to designate um, uh, oaths. And um, what you see here is that, and this is later on in Matthew 23, but here we're going to get to the crux of the matter. What is it that the Pharisees actually believed about oath taking? And what is Christ really trying to say here about your word? Right when you make an oath or you promise to do something. So later on in Matthew 23, verses 16 through 22, this is what he says: Woe to you, blind guides. And he's talking to the about the religious leaders here. Woe to you, blind guides, religious leaders, scribes, Pharisees, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he's bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it in him uh, who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Now, 
Why did I put this here? Because this is what the Pharisees would say. They had certain things where it's like, look, if you use the right formula to make your oath, then you might be bound to it. But if I, if I use different wording to the person I'm swearing to, that may seem like I'm promising to do something. But to me, it's like I'm not bound by it because, and this is what Christ is saying here, you're telling me that um, if anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. And what Christ is saying here is this Pharisaic way of talking about stuff is, oh, I swear by the temple. Knowing the Pharisee knows that what they mean is an oath by the temple doesn't bind me to anything. So Rich, well, I promise you, hey, Rich, man, I swear by the temple I'm going to do that. And you're like, oh, man, he's, he's, he's good. He's good to go. I'm like, whatever. I'm just walking away because I know that 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 doesn't bind me to anything. Does that all make sense? So they had these ritualistic ways of being able to promise things and get out of it, right? So here's what's really going on. If I just want to put this in, in a, a really concise way. What the Pharisees had done is they had adopted ways of either allowing themselves to promise something that they intended to do, right? Like rightfully, they're like, yeah, I'm, I intend to do that. But knowing that if they weren't able to come through on the commitment, that they can get away with it, that they would still be considered righteous, right? That's one thing. I make a promise I totally intend to do, but look, if I don't fulfill it, I still want to be considered righteous. So here's my get out of jail free card, right? That's how they thought about it. There's all these ways in which an oath could become invalid. The other thing, which was actually more deceitful, which is probably more of what Christ is actually getting at here, is the idea that you could deceptively make someone believe that you were intending to do something and promise something when you had absolutely no intention of falling through on it. So this is lying, deceit not just either incapability of coming through on your promise or perhaps even human foible of, of forgetting or whatever else. This is a, the actual intentionality of me saying, Mike, I'm going to do it, knowing that, man, I have no, I'm, I'm doing it to either manipulate you, get something out of you, get you off my back, whatever the case is, with, stop, I'm serious. No, okay. I'm just gonna say it one. That's the last time I'm gonna say it. Um, <clears throat> um. Anyway, those are the two. Those are the two things that'll make sense. Okay. So that's actually what's going on here. What Jesus is doing here is he is reciting some of these common ways in which the Pharisees had given themselves a get-out-of-jail card free. In other words, what they were doing is they were saying that I can maintain my righteousness. I can't be accused of lying or deceit because the oath I swore wasn't in the right formula. Does that all make sense? Okay, that's what's going on here. And Jesus is saying, wait, when God told you in the Mosaic law about swearing oaths, what did he intend? What was his intention? Right there. Okay. He shall do according to all the proceeds out of his mouth. That's what God intended. And they found ways to manipulate that so that they could either be intentionally deceitful or to cover up for when they were not able to fulfill their, um, their obligations. All right. Uh, Arnold says it this way. He says, affirmations became open to interpretation, especially if a person claimed he had mental reservations at the time. Right? So, and we'll get into this in a moment here. Um, if you made if you made a, an oath, but you're like, mm, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't really sure I meant to say that. I wasn't really sure I wanted to commit to that, but I did. Like, they made ways in which they could say, mm, 
I had mental reservations, even if I didn't communicate that to you, I didn't tell you I had reservations, I did. Because I had mental reservations about it, I shouldn't have to be obligated to that, right? So we had mental reservation time. To swear by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem or even by one's own life is empty, since the person taking an oath has no control over any of these things, which is really what Christ is saying, right? When he says, don't swear by heaven or Jerusalem or your head, because guess what? You have no control over any of that, right? You're calling into, um, you're, you're asking for something of which you have no control over to be the, um, uh, the uh, shoot, um, not down payment, but the um, guarantee, uh, it's, I'm thinking, I'm thinking um, collateral. There we go. Thank you very much. You said that. Collateral. Collateral. Like, God is my collateral. Like, when you're getting a loan, here's my collateral. Like, God's my collateral. My head is my collateral. And Jesus is saying, you can't use it, because guess what? You don't own the collateral. That You don't own heaven. You can't make God do anything. God can't be your collateral that then gets brought in to justify your oath. You don't even know. I mean, look at your, your hair, like you and I. Look, I can't make my hair gray or dark. It, it it just happens. Usually after kids. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, my mine was mine was very way before that. But the point, that's the point, right? Is this whole idea of, of that. The righteousness of the law teaches that a person should develop a reputation for honesty so that a yay could be taken as a trustworthy yay and a nay as a that should be yay nay as a trustworthy nay. I apologize. Um so that's the whole thing that's going on here. Now, there were there were some ways in which someone could actually violate their oath, but still consider themselves righteous. Right now, again, this is the Pharisaic teaching. So Jesus, again, is trying to counteract the common Pharisaic teaching about righteousness regarding oath-taking. And so from the rabbi's perspective, you could invalidate an oath you took uh, in under these four different categories, right? Vows of urging. So those were uh, types of things made when you were bar bargaining or trying to incite someone to sell or buy. Hey, you know what? If you do this, I'll give you this, right? It's this whole this it's this whole type of thing, right? And they'd be like, yeah, that's just part. That's just part of what you do when you're buying, right? You, you make promises, you're trying to find leverage, whatever else, but I don't really have any intention of you. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to bring you from, you want to sell it to me at this high price, I want to buy for this low price, and we'll just haggle and promise each other stuff until we finally come up to something that we agree upon, right? So they had these, these ways of saying, that's not really lying. You're not really breaking your promise when you do those types of things, right? That's just part of business, right? That type of thing. There are these um, vows of exaggeration, right? And those were making a vow where it's impossible for you to fulfill the conditions. So sometimes, sometimes we say, you know, crazy things. And the Pharisees would say, that doesn't count because everyone knows it was impossible for you to keep in the first place. So that shouldn't count, right? The only thing, you know, we should only count things that are possible for you to do. So those were vows of exaggeration, right? Um, vow is made in error. Now, this one um, is a, probably a little bit easier for us to understand. Like the first two are kind of like, yeah, th th that seems like um, they're trying to just create a real easy way out of a out of vow that they've made. This one here is uh, vows that were made based on false information. So you've been provided something that's not true, or you believe something that's not true, and then you make a vow based off of wrong information. And so they said, look, I mean, you can't be held responsible for, you know, making a vow when the information that you're provided, that was the context and foundation of that, was not true, right? Um, so they allowed that as well. And then vows made under duress. Now, that's, this one actually seems, again, more reasonable. Someone puts a gun to your head and says, hey, you know, promise me X, Y, Z. Most of us are going to do what? We're going to promise X, Y, Z. Someone's got a gun to your head. That's, that's being made to promise something about under duress, right? So while some of these, we can look at it and go, yeah, I get why the Pharisees sort of took a 
it's not just a black and white yes or no. They allow some degree of variance from a valve. It's really these other ones up here where then they would take that into all kinds of different situations. They say, I, well, I, that's, that's just, I didn't, you know, that's a valve urging. And they would allow themselves uh, to escape that, right? Um, now, they did say that a valve couldn't be annulled. And then some, you read some of the rabbinic writings, some of it's just strange. Like you're trying to figure out what in the world were these guys thinking. But you couldn't uh, annul a vow if you're under the influence of alcohol. Now, that actually can make sense, right? If you're impaired, you shouldn't be making any decisions, making vows or annulling vows. I mean, all that should not, not be possible. But you couldn't do it if you're riding a donkey uh, or while standing. Okay, you had to, if you annul the vow, it had to be made while you were sitting and you had to have a cloak enveloped your body. So there's a certain way in which if you wanted to have a, a vow annulled, there was a certain process and procedure around that. Now, a vow, you couldn't just necessarily annul it yourself, right? So they did have some rules around this. Um, and what you'd have to do is you'd have to go to the rabbis and actually have them decree that, in fact, the vow that you took was no longer valid for you, right? So... Um, this is what uh, Alfred Edersheim uh, says about it. He says, the Jerusalem Talmud in uh, Avad uh, Sarah 40a says, uh, furnished the following curious illustration, which almost reads like a commentary. If a man makes a vow to abstain from food, woe to him if he eateth, and woe to him if he does not eat. If he eateth, he sinneth against his vow. If he does not eat, he sins against his life. What then must he do? Okay, let him go before the sages, and they will absolve him from his vow, right? So, um, this is one of those ones where it's kind of a crazy, probably a rash vow. I'm just not going to eat. I'm hung. I'm on hunger strike. All right. Well, you've just made a vow that is difficult, right? Because you can't eat because if you don't eat, I mean, if you keep the vow to not eat, guess what? You die. But if you die, you sin against the creator who created you. And it's basically you're committing suicide, right? So you can't do that either. So, you got yourself caught into a vow in which there's no easy way out, right? And in this case, what do you have to do? You have to go to the sages and they will absolve you. So in other words, if you think you've taken a vow that you should be freed from, you can just go to the rabbis. And as long as they think it's good enough, you don't have to keep it, right? Yeah, no, yeah, that's, yes, yeah, it, it's, um, I'm sure plenty of that actually um, went on, for sure. Um, now, the other part that, that, um, that, that Christ is pointing out here in this, this session, the section here is, is the idea that, in fact, the rabbis would allow you to swear by things other than just your own integrity, Right. So in other words, your own integrity isn't enough, so they got into the habit of swearing by different things, right? Even by names of God or by his attributes, okay? So this is, again, where Christ is saying, you can't do that, right? So um, in the, in this is the, in the rabbinic writing, uh, Shavuot 4.13, uh, it says, if someone to swear uh, uh, another, uh, to another person, and they would use these things. I adjure you by Aleph Dalit or by yod Hey, right? yod Hey, that's the YH that would stand in place of Yahweh, right? Uh, by Yahweh. Or by the Almighty or by host or by the gracious and merciful, again, characteristics of God. Or by him who is long-suffering and that should say of great loving kindness. Or by any one of God's attributes, they are culpable. If one blasphemes God by any one of these, he becomes liable to the penalty by stoning. So in other words... What the rabbi said here is, hey, look, um, you you can go ahead and swear by, by God, uh, by certain of his names and attributes, not by everything, but by certain names and, and attributes of God as a means of um, ensuring or adding weight to your claim, right? If you do it, though, you're more culpable, right? So... You've called a greater thing than yourself to be a witness and testimony to your, your vow. So if you break it, 
you're more culpable than if it was just you saying it yourself, right? So they actually got into this business, which is why Jesus is saying, hey, look, you can't, you know, don't swear by Jerusalem. Don't swear by heaven, right? All these uh, different types of things. Um, they also, in addition to God, they'd allow um, uh, you to make a, a, a an oath on Moses, but really um, what you were saying is by the one who actually sent Moses, right, as his prophet. And you could even swear by the Bible. So this brings up that really interesting question about when you go into court of law and you uh, put your hand on the Bible and swear to tell the whole truth. Uh, what is it? Uh, swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. I don't know if they still do that anymore in courts of law, but I don't know. Anyway. It's interesting that that's that that's that's the practice because you know Jesus would say, now I know why I know why they do that. There's a uh, people have been afraid at least in times past to call God as their witness if they were lying because God might what strike it in, right? So I, we we understand the the intention of why that might be the case, but Jesus is going to say, like, look, that is not right. Because when God gave the laws about oaths, he intended for you to do what? Keep it. And Rich, when you say, and I'm looking at you because you promised it, you know, remember what you promised last week? No, like, um, your promise should be good enough. Really, what this is all about is about your integrity, right? That's what it comes down to. And when you have to use something external to yourself to make your integrity at a level where someone else will accept what you say, that means that your actions in and of themselves, your integrity is not what? It was not adequate. It's in question. Okay. So, and that's, of course, what the Pharisees would do all the time. So people, you couldn't trust what was actually being said because that meant they weren't people of integrity and yet because they gave themselves a, a get out of jail free card it meant that you could be in either intentionally deceitful or unintentionally deceitful and still be seen as what righteous does everyone all understand what, what's going on here and that's what jesus is trying to say look the pharisees they don't have any integrity and this is just one example of ways in which they gave themselves outs for either Mosaic commandments or for their own commandments because they weren't people of integrity, right? And that's what's at stake, okay? So Jesus here, and again, what he's doing is he's, he's not given a, a list of everything that you shouldn't swear against. This is where some of say, well, I, I, man, I don't see my, I don't see, you know, my life here, he just said my head, right? I mean, he's not trying to say like, this is just the exclusive list, but everything else you can do. He's trying to say, look, the Pharisees tell you that you can swear by things that are outside of your control as a means of increasing your level of integrity, right? And I'm telling you, you can't do it because you do not control any of these. He says, don't do it by heaven. Why? Because heaven is... The throne of God. How do you have any control over God's throne? I mean, even as a believer, can you make God do anything? But yet, when you swear by him, you are saying God will guarantee the result. And you have put God on the hook for something that God didn't put himself on the hook for. Does that all make sense? That's what's going on. Okay, or by earth. Why not by earth? You don't control earth. Who's, whose possession is earth? It's God's. He's the creator. You didn't create squat. You didn't create anything. So you can't take what is God's and claim it as your own. What's the earth going to do anyway? Like if you don't come through on your promise, what's going to happen? Is the earth going to disappear? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like you say, I swear by the earth that I'm going to do this. And if you don't, what's going to happen? I mean, the earth's not going to disappear. It's not going to poof out of existence. You're literally swearing by something that's meaningless as a way to increase your level of integrity, right? And I should say Jerusalem. So 
Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's how we say it. That's how we say it in, in Italian. Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I got it. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, and again, because Jerusalem was the city of God, it's God's divine city, and you have no control over that, right? So, same thing with our head. Like, you don't control it. There's some things that I control about my body, like I'll eat better, maybe go uh, exercise. But we all know there are things that happen to your body that you cannot control. And getting old, we can maybe, like, not contribute to getting old, or we can maybe do some things that might slow some of that process down. But eventually, we are all going to wind up in a pine box. So you don't have any control over that. And for you to sort of put your life there as this as the stake or your head as the means of increasing your integrity, Jesus says, don't do it. Oh, so hold on just a second. Let me just get through real quick, and then I will open up. We'll have lots of, uh, lots of things to say, hopefully. All right. So, conclusion. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, what that means is that we have to be people that when I say I'm going to do it, everyone knows I'm going to do it. The problem is, is we sometimes or many times aren't those types of people. Now let me just get you. Uh, let me just let me just throw some stuff out there that might be uh, more close to home because most of us don't make these outlandish, you know, bows to uh, you know to to someone. You know, we make lots of little promises to people that we don't keep. Okay, so think about the house, your home life. If you're married, sitting there and you're watching the football game, you're watching your favorite war movie, right? Or Columbo, like I like to watch. Okay. And the wife or husband comes by and says, Hey, can you do XYZ? And what do you do? Sure, you got it. Got it. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Yeah, got it. Okay. Right. You've committed to something, but yet we do it without even thinking because it, it only says, now here's where here's here's the point. Not as it's a matter of integrity. It means you've made a commitment to somebody that you have shown that you don't care for them in that moment. They are asking you to do something. And what have you done? You've used a promise as a means of what? Getting rid of them. In the moment, I'm not that interested in what you have to say. I'm much more interested in watching the Seahawks see if they're going to score. But yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I got it. I got it. I'll, I'll take out the garbage. I got it. If you asked me after the game whether or not I promised anything, you know what I'd say? I don't remember. I, don't remember. I didn't say I was going to take out the garbage. And he did. I don't remember that. So even things we have to watch because we need to be people of integrity for our families, for bosses, our businesses, for our friends. And I think too lightly, Jesus would say, we just say things that we will do or not do, and we don't really even think about whether or not what we even committed to sometimes or whether or not we even plan on fulfilling that. Right? There's a there's a uh, there's a meme that I saw on uh, Facebook. I don't really do a lot on Facebook, but I saw it. I thought it was kind of it's it's intended to be funny, but there's something about a uh, husband sitting there and he's talking to his wife and he goes, Look, I don't have to be reminded every six months to do the thing that I promised you like three years ago or something like that, right? It's some kind of crazy thing. And of course, it's all chuckles and laughs. But at the root of that is you made a promise. And guess what? Six months later, you haven't done it. You're like, yeah, I'll do it. Six months later, you haven't done it. And sure enough, you're three years down the road promising your wife that you've done something. You haven't done anything. And so it, it, I know this seems like this may not be a big deal, but in your family, are you the type of person that can be counted on? So if I tell my son, and I've been guilty of this, like when I was thinking about this this whole week, I'm thinking, gosh, you know, I say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go out and play basketball with you, or yeah, I'll, I'll take a look and do whatever. And I, I, I'm I'm focused on work, I'm whatever else, and I might even intend to do that, but things get carried away. 
And then he'll say, hey, daddy, you know, are you still going to go out and do that? I'll be like, hey, buddy, it's, it's too late. It's late, it's dark. It's not too late because he made it too late. It's too late because I made it too late. And yet, if you do that enough, what is the response of that individual? No, in fact, I'll tell you, you always make promises you don't keep. Well, I've actually heard that. I've heard that before. And so that's what I'm saying. You heard because what you do, if, if we just talk pragmatically here, I'm not talking about big stuff. I'm talking about these things. What it shows the person is you truly aren't paying attention. You don't care about what I've asked you. You don't care about what's important to me. Your promise is dismissive. It's what it is. You're 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 showing you're not respect. Now, if we go back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, what is the attitude of someone who is righteous? They are what? Loving, merciful, peaceful, like. So when we do these types of things and we show that we are people that aren't people of integrity, we are telling the other person that we don't care about you. Like there is a there is a level of a disrespect or whatever you might want to call it that they get because they're the ones that you promise something to. We allow ourselves to get off the hook all the time. It's too busy with work. Whatever else. Now, there are times when we promise something and an emergency happens, right? Like someone's in a car accident and you just got to leave. And, you know, I mean, there are there are honestly times when you don't have any control over the ability to be able to go through on that promise. But I'd say the vast majority of things that we commit to people that we don't fulfill, we just give ourselves a pass, right? And we are not, what? The two greatest commandments are what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and what? Love your neighbors yourself. And when we make promises that we don't keep, we are showing that we don't love our neighbor. This is not to be family or friends or whatever. It could be, it could be anybody, your boss, whatever else. That, does everyone kind of get what I'm saying here? Like, we need to take what Jesus is saying down from some other level here and realize that I'm super guilty because like I said, I've heard this stuff before. And when I hear it, my first reaction is, no, I'm not like that. And then it's like, yeah, 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 you are. Yeah, you've been dismissive many times and not paid attention many times and then giving yourself a pass for it. And then blame the other person when they don't feel like they can trust you anymore. Right? Okay, um, we're almost done here, and then I will stop. We'll open up for some some questions here. Um, Louis uh, Barbieri, in his commentary on Matthew, says this. He says, "Is again, this is just sort of rounding out this discussion on the law of oaths. The Pharisees were notorious for their oaths, which were made on the least provocation. Yet they made allowances for mental reservations within their oaths. If they wanted to be relieved of oaths, they had been they, they had made by heaven, by earth, by Jerusalem, or by one's own head. They could argue that since God Himself had not been involved, had not been involved in their oaths, and had not been involved, their oaths were not binding. But Jesus said oaths should not even be necessary. Do not swear at all. Now, again, he's not contradicting the Mosaic law. He's just saying you should be a person of integrity where you don't even need to do it. Like, he's not saying to go against the law of Moses, but he's saying your integrity should be so high that you don't need to swear by anything. You don't even need to do that. You can just say, yes, I'll do it, right? The fact that oaths were used at all emphasized the wickedness of man's heart. Furthermore, swearing by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem is binding since they are God's stone footstool and steady, respectively. Even the color uh, of the hair on their heads was determined by God. So in other words, even though the Pharisees said, yeah, these aren't binding, like I can use this little, these, these, these little rituals or these little saints to get myself off the hook, what Barbieri is saying here is, in reality, you've 
sworn and you've used God as your collateral, guess what? God's going to hold you accountable because you've used him in a way that's inappropriate. And if you just want to sort of break it lightly, God doesn't take it lightly, even if you do, right? Okay. Questions. We'll open up for questions or comments. Yes. I have two questions. First question is, does all of this stuff in the Mishnah, is that right? The rabbinic, is it rabbinic laws? You're talking about the, the ways the rabbis would... The, the like, extra yes, yes, uses yes, of yes. oaths and all of that that yes, was supposedly in the, in the rabbinic laws. That's in the so rabbinic this is like extra... It's not biblical. Uh, mosaic law, yes, right? It's not. It's beyond, it's the surrounding laws that the Pharisees made up Yes. To try and better do the Mosaic laws. Well, in, in some cases, yes. In many, for the most part, the rabbinic laws, they were extra biblical, and their intention was, at least at the beginning, was to provide that fence around the Mosaic right. laws. They wouldn't break it. But in some cases, particularly around the time of Christ, by this time, some of their laws were means by which they could get away with breaking the law. So I'll just let me just give you a quick example okay. so we can make sure it's clear. Sure. For instance, on God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Mm -hmm. And he said next to this that you are not to do any work on the Sabbath, otherwise you are to be killed. Right? Now, they said, well, gosh, you know, we, you can't walk it's more than a certain distance. Otherwise, it's a work. Well, if you're a Pharisee and you don't want to stay at home and you want to go to the beach, you got to figure out a way to get to the beach. Well, how do you do that when you can't walk very far? Well, I got my cup here and I got my phone and I got this right here. These all belong to me. They represent my, my home. So I just walk the prescribed distance and as long as I have that there, I'm good. And then I can continue to walk along a certain distance. I can put down my cup. And I'm good. I can just keep on doing things and stationing certain... St this is what they would do. So that at any point they could say, I'm at home. I haven't broken God's law. So, so sometimes, many times, they, did, they put these laws in place to not break them. But sometimes what they, the laws they did were so that they could break them and still consider themselves to be what? Righteous. Righteous. That's all what we're talking about. Righteous. And... Jesus is going to, what we're going to see later on, he's going to pick up on this concept a lot, where he's going to point out the ways in which they were doing things just so they could break laws that they held other people accountable to, but not themselves, and still feel righteous. Now, sorry, so, continue on. So my question is, do these rules around oaths exist because there's no like written law to manage society like business transactions and stuff like that is like is that the reasoning behind having all of these extra types of oaths and everything as if it was like you know business law that we have today that's written down in books that are not expensive yeah because i'm guessing that then there wasn't a lot of paper floating around and so any of the laws that were held were basically in the skulls of the pharisees that made them up or the roman governor or whoever it's like yep and you're actually is, um, is that right yeah so basically um if you think uh back at this time it's not that people were illiterate which i think is a wrong people a lot of times people said they were illiterate there certainly was a higher much higher level of illiteracy back then than there than there is now but the problem was is you know printing presses Right. Right. So, yes, to a certain degree, there were scribes. Those those were people that were trained in government documentation. Right. That's actually one of the roles and functions that they played in the Old Testament. You would have a scribe that would be a court scribe that would do all that kind of stuff. And most people didn't have you didn't have you couldn't go to the store or your office depot or Home Depot or whatever the place is. Not Home Depot, but Office Depot and Office Max is what it is. And go grab yourself a ream of paper. So you are correct that. Many times these transactions were made, they were verbal transactions, 
made many times with articles and not paper. So if you're going to make a um, an oath to someone, you might take off your sandal and give them your sandal, right? Um, you, you look back in, um, remember when Judah uh, is um, going down and he runs into Tamar, right? His Tamar, his daughter-in-law, who his oldest son has died because he was wicked, God killed him. And then his next son is supposed to go in and provide children through her and decides that he doesn't want his children to be named after his brother. So he doesn't complete the act. God kills him. So Judah says, well, I don't want my next son to be killed by God as well. So he didn't do that. And so on his way down to go uh, meet his friend and take care of his fox, what does is, what is Judah do? He finds his daughter-in-law hears that he's coming down. And so what does she do? She disguises herself as a prostitute. Because she's like, if you're not going to give your sons to me, father-in-law, you're going to give me sons. And so she disguises herself as a prostitute. And But in order to pay for that, he doesn't have the money with him. So what does he do? He gives what? An oath, I'm guessing. Sta his, st his staff and cord is signet as a pledge that he will come back and bring the money for the services that she's rendered. So, so, is that, so is that like an IOU? It's like an IOU. Yeah. So, so I guess my whole point, this is a super long story, and it, it probably was super tangential. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that, yes, there's not a lot of written stuff. Right. But I could do things like give you a sandal, or in this case, she gave that as there's a pledge. It's not written down. But in order for you to get back this, this, this signet and this, this, this cord that you have that is recognizable as yours, that if you don't come back, I can tell everybody, look what you did. So in other words, that was a means of, of uh, engaging in that type of, um, of an oath, in this case, that doesn't involve written paper. So you're, you're spot on that, that that just didn't happen very much. People didn't have access. Even like the, the, uh, the scriptures, you would, there were very few copies around. You would find them in your synagogue, but you wouldn't find them in your house unless you were right. extremely wealthy it was all memorized, right. right? Not written. So the other the other question is, if if these rules were basic, <clears throat> you know, you would say, "I swear an oath on X Y Z because I know that it's not binding." Doesn't everybody know it's not binding? Wouldn't it be like if you've ever done business in the Middle East or in China, you know that you know just because you've signed a contract, the deal isn't done you continue to negotiate past that. Yeah. When you try and get your first deposit, you're negotiating. When you're trying to get paid for your, you know, it's like, it's an ongoing process and everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't, doesn't it kind of lend itself to that sort of thing where, you know, it, it, it totally what's does. the point? But it, maybe that's what Jesus is trying to say. But, it's like, this is ridiculous. Just say yes or no. That, no, that, that's, that is actually his point is that, you're making all these oaths, and then you're bringing in God as your collateral for this, as your witness. Right. You're not a trustworthy person. If you're a trustworthy, you wouldn't have to make the oath. And that, that's his whole point, is that, is that it's the wickedness in the person's heart that allows them to think that they can make a commitment that they either don't intend from the start to fulfill or they might think, well, if I don't do it, I don't do it, no big deal. That's the attitude. So again, everything that, that Christ is saying up to this point has all been about what? The heart condition. And their heart condition was, doesn't really matter. I can save these things and hopefully people will buy me buy it. Hopefully if I use enough of, I swear by the temple or whatever else, people will actually be like, oh, he must be serious. He must really be serious now. Like when he said yes, he wasn't serious, but he must be really serious now. And he's just saying, that just comes from an evil heart. It comes from a person who has no intention of fulfilling what they have promised. Over and over again. So yeah, you know, I, 100%, I think that, that that's, what he's, that's what he's saying. is This useless stuff. Be a person of integrity. So basically what he's saying is, is, you know, if you're a man of your word, you're, you, you have to have high integrity. Yeah. 
Now, if you're going to if you're going to uh, talk to talk, walk the walk. That's right. Right. Yep. I just think it's really amazing that he talks about this right after he talked about divorce. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, whether or not there, that that was his intention, certainly marriage is a vow, and that would certainly be a vow that many in his time were not intending to keep. Or they intended to keep it when they made the vow, but once things got hard or someone burned their soup, they could break that for sure. Yeah. But yeah, and Mike, I had not, had not thought about whether or not there was a logical flow, and there might actually be a logical flow to how he's laid some of that out. He said, he said for divorce, the only way you can have a divorce is if there's infidelity. And um, and I think he just follows up with with that with vows. Yeah, and that's that could be that's actually um, a possibility I hadn't considered about the, the the logical flow of how he had ordered some of those things. It's a good point. I noticed a couple of things as uh, other than Jerusalem as Salome. <laughs> other than that, as as you were as you were reading and, and sharing that. Uh, some of them, if they had kept their vows and really paid the penalty, uh, they would be they would be out out of cash mm -hmm. very soon. You yeah. know, a lamb here and a goat here and another one down the trail. Uh, they wouldn't be able to last very long. And you're talking about the Mosaic Law required yeah. that if you made right. a rash vow, that right. it wasn't just I'm sorry. And now I'll go do what I said I'm going to do. That you had to actually pay a, a sin, a burnt offering mm -hmm. for the sin. So it would cost you not only what you promised, but it would cost you livestock. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So if, if I guess what you're saying is like, if every time you promise somebody something, if you said, look, I'm going to go ahead and donate a hundred bucks to the church or charity, whatever else, some of us wouldn't have any money in our bank account. Yeah. Yeah. Short story. Yeah, go ahead. Didn't even have to be short. Yeah, we're, my, we're all good. We're in the Q and A yeah. time right now. <laughs> my mother uh, and I had some discussions. I was a bookworm, and she come by and asked me to do something. Sure, mom. <laughs> and she come back in. Are you going to do it? Sure, mom. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Finally, she came around and pulled my ear. Are you going to do it? <laughs> she got my attention. Yes, Mom, I'll get up and go do it. But, uh, you know, sometimes we we <laughs> we fall into that pattern that we are listening but not really listening, mm -hmm. and we put it off uh, for another day or another year or down the trail. And those those are things that uh, that I have to confess. Yeah, and and that's that's really. I mean, the point is, is when you think about what you in that situation, what you're doing, you're not. You just want your mom to go away, mm -hmm. because the book is more interesting. And granted, it's probably more interesting taking out the garbage. So let's be honest. Reading the book's more interesting to you, but you've just told her, "I don't really care about whatever it is that you that you want," and so our lack of respect towards somebody else by using vows and promises as just dismissive means of being able to get on with our day is really just disrespectful and un unloving to that person right now you may still be able to put down your book and have a conversation in the end you don't have to do whatever it is because you're but that's different than having a conversation but what you just said i think every single one of us here have probably done that more often than we'd like to count. And, and I know I, I've been convicted of this because I've heard these things and I'm like, hmm, yeah, you're right. I, I do that. Like sometimes you'll get somebody that will grab you. I've been grabbed, <laughs> been grabbed by the face and told, look at me. Like, look, like, like, look at me. Look, your eyes better be looking at my eyes. If they're not looking at my eyes, I don't want, you know, that's, that tells you right there that they understand how much you don't value their feedback or their time or their requests. 
right? Anyway, yes, Mike. Well, I'd like to make a confession as well. <laughs> it's just, this is this is a little confessional. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to confess something that happened a thousand years ago. Are you calling? Are you calling him a thousand years old? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is good, Mike. I love you, Aura. <laughs> um, I'm going through this right now. Yeah. Uh, I've been married for 30 years, and I love my wife dearly. Mm -hmm. And I promised her years ago to get some projects done. And one thing after another came up in my life, health issues. And um, I have not been able to get back to do what I promised. Mm -hmm. And she reminds me daily, mm. you know, you promised me. She even says, she calls herself a, uh, a chump because she feels like I'm letting her down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, these projects are fairly, you know, insurmountable they're and, you know and i'm getting older i'm not getting any younger and um i've come up with excuses so when you're talking about this and these things are going on in my life um you know you just you're laying on to me something that i think about every day and i just don't have i don't have an answer as to why i'm not going and repairing homes and getting things done mm -hmm. um, and i could easily hire somebody else to do it but i'm highly capable of doing it all myself mm -hmm. so um i've asked prayer from many a men's group um i've asked for prayer from uh, friends to help me get this cloud off of me this I want to say that there's even demons affecting me, but uh, I've got some issues that uh, I just can't, I don't seem to be able to, um, to deal with mm -hmm. and overcome. And I feel like I'm being a chump. And the last thing I want to do is hurt my wife because I love her dearly. Yeah, I think that's again going back to back to what we're going to get to next week is how do you demonstrate love for another individual? All right, like he's going to Jesus is going to really start out with the beatitudes, and he's going to kind of circle around and sort of close off at least the main portion of this of this sermon. It's really just comes full circle to. Um, the righteous person, they just operate differently. Like they're just different people. Mm -hmm. The recognizable is, is different. We live our lives differently and not always conveniently, right? That that's the thing. In fact, a lot of what he's going to say is not convenient. Right? It's not convenient to stay married when maybe your the spark is gone or whatever. I mean, it's not convenient, right? It's not it's, none of that's convenient. It's not convenient to deal with your anger in an appropriate way it's easier to fly off the handle right mm -hmm. it's easy to make promises that we don't either intend to keep or with we think we're going to but we're, we just make them rashly like it's it's not easy i mean so in other words the righteous person is going to live in a way that is going to be decidedly different and recognizable to the world and it's not going to be easy so i hear you i need to be more righteous no, I, and, and I, what you what you have just said, I can almost guarantee everyone here would be like, "I got you. I, I'm I signed up to the same, the same plan that you did. Yeah, it's not a good plan. Like uh, we've I all need, been there. On I that. need to develop a relationship with God, and then use that relationship with God to my relationship with man. And then uh, Fruit and Bomb says that a neighbor is anyone who has a need that can be met. Mm -hmm. My wife is my neighbor. And I have to love her as I love myself. I mean, I've even used things like, honey, it's it's not God's time. 
you know, maybe you're being over demanding on, you know, what you want me to, what you want me to do. It's just, you know, just one excuse after another, now that I sit here and see all of this. Yeah. I mean, in, in uh, you know, we're all guilty. So this isn't, this isn't, we're all guilty of giving ourselves a pass when we won't give other people a pass, right? We, we just like the Pharisees, it's easy to make excuses for our own behavior that make us sort of feel like it's okay to do that. And I think Jesus is saying, hey, look, we just got to get real with ourselves, whether it's our thought life or whether it's our commitment to our spouse or whether it's how we deal with anger because we are going to be unjustly treated in ways that should cause us to be angry. But how do you deal with that? Right. So, um, yeah, not, yeah, not, not, not easy stuff, but that's why he's calling out because the Pharisees will take the easy way. Yeah. It's interesting how much uh, people think of our word anymore. They don't take our word unless they have our name on the paper. Mm -hmm. It used to be that you have a handshake and speak, and it was done. But our, our society right now, if it's not on paper and you have the money in the bank to back it and all those things, your word isn't worth anything. Mm -hmm. It used to be, uh, now this is not to be, uh, you know, uh, it's, it used to be called the gentleman's agreement. We could just call it a people's agreement, but that's, that's essentially what it used to be, right? And that's uh, essentially what Jesus is saying is that's how we should operate um, from that realm. Okay, uh, any other uh, any other questions? I do want to try to get to this law of non-retaliation. Any, any other comments or questions on this? Nope. Nope. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, the law of non-retaliation. So um, this is uh, this is going to be interesting uh, for us to look at this here. And again, Jesus is not given a full dissertation on. What happens when someone is mistreating you? Okay, it's not what he's he's not he's not doing that, right? So, but he is addressing a certain kind of specific perspective of the Pharisees. Okay, so keep that in mind because too many times people have taken these verses out of context and claimed that as believers we should be doormats that willingly allow ourselves to be abused and taken advantage of. and have even used that to tell others that you have to submit to abuse because jesus told you to turn the other cheek and we've asked people to be in dangerous situations because that's what jesus would do so let's make sure we're very clear about what jesus is saying here in the law of retribution and what he is not saying okay all right. Um, the context of this section here, and I think I actually, um, oh, sorry, I, I went one, one uh, slide too far. Okay. Um, you're probably wondering what in the heck I'm talking about because I didn't even show you what the scripture verse was. All right. So it's Matthew 5, 38 through 42. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now that is actually in the Bible. That is the Mosaic law. Okay. Okay, you've heard it said an eye for an eye, but what did the Pharisees mean when they said an eye for an eye or two for two? That's what he said when he says, you've heard it said, it's what he's talking about is what is the Pharisaic interpretation of the Mosaic law? That's what's wrong, not the Mosaic law. What I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. All right. There's a lot of stuff here. And gosh, I'm not sure we're going to get done with this time. We may have to pick this up next week. But we'll see. Um, so the context for this is what's called the lex talionis or the law of retaliation. 
And you find that in several different uh, verses here within the Old Testament law. So again, the Mosaic law actually provided for the lex talionis. In other words, God said, true justice means you poke out an eye, guess what happens? Your eye gets poked out, right? God was, God, God says, look, justice is, needs to be served. And he's the one that prescribed an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth. Not God did, okay? So again, we have to understand what Jesus is saying here because he's not contradicting the Mosaic law. So for instance, Exodus 21 says, but if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. That's what God said, okay? True justice. Now, what we should understand here by this is that when God gave the command, he was trying to avoid one of two things. The first one is retaliation that was over and above the harm that was caused, right? You knock a tooth out, that doesn't mean you kill your neighbor, right? A tooth doesn't equal a life, right? A tooth is a tooth, right? Or under justice. In other words, you do something where um, you know, you commit a, a crime or an offense against someone here, and yet the judicial system would say, yeah, I'm just going to get a slap on the wrist. But wait, he, just, he killed my only cow. Yeah, I know, that's, that's how it works. You know, right? So God is presenting a form of justice that says an eye for an eye. That should be the way that we should view retribution for when somebody has harmed another person. Okay, that's, that's the first thing we got to keep in mind, is the intention. Leviticus says, whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death, right? A life for life. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make good life for life. Take an animal's life, you got to give the person an animal back. If uh, anyone injures his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good. And whoever kills a person shall be put to death. Okay, pretty clear. Deuteronomy, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a, Now, here's the deal. This one here is about false witnesses, right? If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord and before the priest and the judges who are in the office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and is accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. Hey, I'm, I'm bringing false witness because I want this harm to happen to him, and if it's found out you're a false witness, whatever you intended for that person, God says should be done to you, right? Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. You shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest uh, shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. So again... The purpose of this is God's giving of this is not only to restorative of the person, whatever harm has been done, but also preventative, right? That's the reason why capital punishment is intended to initially be preventative. Don't kill someone or you might, you might be killed yourself, right? Um, your eye shall uh, not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. All right. So that is the Mosaic law. So Christ cannot be saying that the Mosaic law is not correct because he would be at that point contradicting himself who gave the Mosaic law. So that's not what he's saying here. So with that as a context, we cannot interpret what Jesus says as the fact that when harm is done to you, there is no restitution needed for the harm. Does that all make sense? Because it's been taken that way in Christian circles as you just be a doormat and Hey, if a burglar comes in your house and wants your TV, you bring them upstairs and open the safe for them. Like, just open the house for them, let them take whatever they want, right? And just weird nonsense, that is not the intention. All right. We already said this here, is that the concept of this lex talionis is that the punishment should not exceed the crime, the punishment should not be less than the crime, and it was intended to be judiciously fair. Like, we can say it makes perfect sense. Righteousness seems to be an eye for an eye. That seems to be fair, right? Okay. Now, here's the problem. Lex talionis was meant in for what 
context? Was it meant for personal vengeance? And if not, what was the context? Lex Talionis, just because we're short on time here, I'll answer my own question. Lex Talionis was meant to be done judicially in a justice system, okay? So when God gave that command, if you had an issue, you brought it to the judges, they would judge. And then if the person was found guilty, hey, you killed somebody else's animal, then you would have to repay that. It is in a judicial sense. So there is nothing wrong with Jesus is here has nothing to do about whether or not there is appropriate righteous restitution through the judicial system. Does that all make sense? What God says, even in the Old Testament, is what? Vengeance is whose? Mine, says the Lord. So the problem was, is that God gave Lex Talionis in the context of judicial law. Okay? What the Pharisees did is they said they took it as a means of personal vengeance. You harm me, I'm going to harm you back. Like, this isn't being brought to the courts. This isn't being adjudicated and, and, and the, the facts and everything done. You've done something to me. I'm going to do right back to you. Right? And in fact, I'm going to do it to you. Um, and I'm going to do it with vengeance. Right? That is what they had done. They had made it so that this became a law of personal vengeance, not of judicial restitution. And that's where it's wrong. Okay? So Jesus is saying, look, when these things are done to you, you are not to act out of your own personal vengeance. But he's not saying that it shouldn't be judicially addressed, right? Okay, this does not deny our ability for self-defense. As some people have said, hey, someone, someone's trying to beat you up. Just let them wail on you. Don't fight it. Hopefully they don't kill you. Good luck. He's not talking about that. He's talking about if someone were to do something, slap you in the face, if you're going to then take personal vengeance on them, oh, you're going to do that? I guess I'm going to do the same thing to you. And now it becomes this whole personal thing. That's what he is saying. He's against that because that's what the Pharisees said. They turned it into a personal vengeance and not a um, judicial. Now, Here's the problem, and I want you to just keep this in mind. The second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. When we engage in personal vengeance, what does that do to the second law? It, it overrides it. It puts, your, it puts your feelings ahead of what God's command to you was. Hard to be loving to someone when you hate their guts and you want to you don't you, yeah. do, do you see what i'm saying like this personal vengeance was a way in which you could be angry at your brother righteously and then go and do what they did to you back to them and feel good about it does that all make sense so it violates the second law because you are not acting towards that person in love. Now, that doesn't mean that there doesn't need to be restitution. That doesn't need to, that there doesn't need to be peace and harmony and things that need to be done to restore whatever that relationship is or things like that. But it does mean when we act out of personal vengeance towards someone, we are not acting out of love to them, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, all through the, all through these beatitudes, it's uh, Jesus is, is putting love for love should be the first go to reaction. Or everything else we do should be filtered through love, as we're commanded. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, Mike, exactly right. Supernatural, right? Because um, here's what I think about when you think about the Pharisees, who use this as then a means of saying, "Oh, all right, I'm going to feel righteous about it. I'm going to do what I, I'm. I'm going to repay evil for evil." Essentially, in this case, you know, what it reminds me of anyone have kids? You ever see like I got. You know, I got two boys. I won't, I won't squeal on them. But you ever see two kids, like one kid punches the other, and what does the other one do? Punch it right back. And what do they say? What, what, what's, what's, what's the justification? He hit me first. 
that is what this is is this is children this is adults acting like kids well he hit me first didn't you have to punch him yeah i did he punched me in the face i punched him in the face i mean he stole my cookie so next time he gets something guess what i'm gonna do i'm gonna steal it back do you know what I'm talking about? Like you keep this, there's a record of wrong that is kept and it doesn't matter if I take personal vengeance now or I take personal vengeance a week from now when you get your special cookie and when your, your back is turned, I'm going to eat your cookie. Like essentially what this does is this is the mindset that says I keep a personal list of wrongs done to me and I am going to make sure I collect. Does that make sense? That is the attitude of the Pharisees. And that is the attitude that Jesus says, you cannot have that attitude. The attitude of collecting wrongs against you or sorry, of, 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 of noting that wrongs against you and then collecting on those wrongs is not the heart of a righteous person and believer. And in fact, the rest of the Testament is going to go on to say, picking up on this, this idea from Christ, that it is better to be wronged in many cases than to retaliate. I'm not talking judicially here. It is better to be wronged and sometimes wronged. than to get what is due. Wronged. wronged. So I'll give you examples. How many times have you heard of best friends, siblings, parents, whatever else, that have gotten into fights and don't talk to each other because somebody didn't, somebody took some money or somebody didn't pay back. We went on a trip and so and so didn't cover their cost for the hotel room. And now I'm what? Mad. I'm talking to you. Like, I do read your mail. Yes, I do. Like, but there is, but there is a sense in which we're going to read this here in just a moment that. It's better, Rich, for you to say, you know what? Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. Because God's going to actually reward you for not. Remember, vengeance is whose? Yeah. Who keeps score? God does. Who is the one who takes care of the person, the evildoer? God. Who rewards the righteous for, in this case, not retaliating tooth for tooth in a vengeance? God does. God knows you got cheated. 1400 bucks out of the hotel room rich that doesn't mean that you should ask for it but it certainly doesn't mean that you get a chance to say i'm going to cheat that person back right which is exactly what they were doing okay is everyone so are we kind of getting the the the, the flavor of what's going on here um let me read what uh uh barbieri says here and again i like because I, I like how he sort of sums this up he says the law was given to protect the innocent make sure retaliation did not occur beyond the offense jesus pointed out however that while the rights of the innocent were protected by the law and they were the righteous need not here's the here's the key the righteous need not necessarily claim their rights when you are offended and i mean rightfully offended that does not mean that Jesus necessarily wants you to go claim your rights. Chalk it up. This is what the person did for me. I'm within my rights to get retribution. Jesus is calling us to a higher ethic that would say, in some cases, perhaps most cases, it's better for us to be at peace and to love the offender than it is to assert our own claims of justice. Does that all make sense? We're all clear? All right, so it says here, a righteous man would be characterized by humility and selflessness. Instead, he might go the extra mile to maintain peace when wronged by being struck on a cheek or sued for his tunic, undergarment, uh, or forced to travel with someone a mile, he would not strike back, demand repayment, or refuse to comply. Instead of retaliating, he would do the opposite and would also commit his case to the Lord, who would one day set all things in order. This was seen to his greatest extent in the life of our Lord Jesus, as Peter explained in 1 Peter 2.23. Okay? So, I'm just going to wrap this up here. Jesus is asking us, there's a, there's a higher ethic. He's not denying legal justice for retribution. He is saying, 
your own personal vengeance shouldn't come into this. And that when somebody wrongs you, you actually have an opportunity to do good, right? So notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, 17 through 21. Never pay back evil for evil. Now, again, Paul isn't saying that there isn't a justice system. In fact, he'll, he'll even talk about some of that stuff later on in Romans 13. What he's saying here is, don't just say, oh, you punched me in the face. I'm going to punch you in the face. Like, you're repaying what? It was evil for the person to do to you. Do you want to repay them back in the same way they repaid you? So Paul says, don't do that. Don't be that kind of person. Don't repay back evil for evil. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, and this is one of my favorite verses, as if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. The grounding principle of what Christ is actually saying here is what Paul just said. Peace should be our main goal, not, not retribution. Peace should be a main goal, not getting what's mine, not getting my due, not paying that person back, right? Be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the, now listen, leave room for the wrath of God. You think your wrath is hot, which is God's wrath. So we don't have to worry about ensuring that person gets their due. And that's most, that's, that's a lot of times that's what we do. I want to make sure that like you get what's coming to you. We don't have to worry about that. We've got the creator of the universe that says, leave that up to me. My wrath is way worse than your wrath, by the way. So we don't have to worry about someone getting, quote, getting their due. God will take care of them. Which is why we don't have to fight all the time for our rights. We don't have to fight all the time for getting back at that person. Leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, here's what Paul goes on, picking up on this idea that Christ has already just said. He's not saying anything different than what Christ has said. In addition to being at peace, in addition to giving your life to God and saying, God, you're in control, you repay, not me. So those are the two principles so far, peace, God, and God is the one that will do it. What does he, Paul, Paul say here that's in conjunction or in complete alignment with Christ has said? But if your enemy is hungry, what? Feed him. Easy to feed someone you like, hard to feed your enemy. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, what? What is the purpose? Not because you really like them. I mean, not, not because you have a fondness for them. I mean, they're an, you're, they're an enemy for a reason. So you probably may have a hard time with feeling like you want to hang around them, right? Palling around. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So there's two things. There's actually four basic things that Paul says here. The third thing is what? When you do not repay evil for evil, what does it do to the person that has done evil to you? Which saying this, what does that mean? Burning coals means what? Guilt. Guilt. If I do something to you, and I know, I look, I know I stole from you. I know, I know I've cheated you, whatever the case is. I know, yeah, sorry. I know that. And do you know what I expect? Because what do we humanly expect the other person to do if it's in their capacity? Retaliate. So my expectation is that. And when you don't retaliate in the way that I expect, and I know I've been a, I know I'm wrong. That guilt of me knowing that I'm the one that's in the wrong and you have not acted in the exact same evil way that I have, that should prick my conscience. Right? And that's what Paul's saying. It's like, look, let the conscience God has put in that person do the work for you. If you want to burn them, let their conscience burn them by you not acting in a way that they think humans typically act. That all make sense? Okay, and he says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So the last point that he's saying here is this. When someone's punched you in the face, and you want to punch him right back, what have you just added into the world, if we were thinking of a world like a cup? 
right? Every, every, every evil, every evil thing that's done is like a drop. Like you have a cup and you have a little dropper. So every time there's evil, like a little drop goes in the cup. They've just put a drop in the cup. And when you retaliate, what do you do? You just add some more. He's just saying, look, do we really want the world to become more evil because of our own vengeance and our own anger and hatred for what someone else has done to us? Like, we're contributing to the world being an evil place. We are not lowering the temperature. We're not bringing, we're not bringing God's grace to the world. We're just taking the, our own eyedropper and dropping our own evil into the cup. What Paul's saying, right? Okay. Um, and then what was just referenced here is, is uh, Jesus being our example. Now, this is, Mike, you said this. This takes supernatural because this is not a human response. Peter says this. He says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, now here's, here's, the, here's the point that ties in. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's what Paul just said. I don't have to retaliate. This isn't talking about legal, you know, legal means for restitution and things. It doesn't mean that, you know, if you get in a car accident, you can't sue the insurance company because they don't pay for, you know, your medical. I mean, we're not talking about that kind of stuff. We're talking about, I don't have to repay injustice directly to that person of a personal vengeance. And Christ has showed us that because he didn't respond in the same way, but he did what? He entrusted himself to Christ, to God. Which is what Paul just says up above. So that is the, uh, oops, that's for next week. Um, that's the law of non retaliation. Okay, so I'll open up for a quick QA here. So if we took a hypothetical situation where the state of Israel was populated by Christ loving Christians. Bad, bad. Okay. How how would we apply these two verses to October seventh? All right, so so again, so great 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 question. Now remember, this is, does not apply judicially, which can be extended to uh, a government. In other words, what Christ isn't saying here is that a nation cannot defend itself, right? It's also not saying that you shouldn't, through legal means have restitution and that the evildoer does not have to pay. In fact, Paul's going to go on and talk about the state has the right of the what? The sword. Right? So, now, so you just keep on reading in Romans what, what he's going to say. So again, he's only talking here about you've done, you've wronged me and I want to get you back. I'm going to repay you for what you did personally. He's not talking about a nation's ability for self-defense. He's not even talking about your ability for self-defense. Like you're being mugged. He's not saying you can't you can't fight back there. He's talking about again the slapping on the cheek. So let's, let's just be let's just be clear about this. The slapping on the cheek is not talking about someone getting in a fist fight with you. It's talking about someone that the slap is meant as an insult. They're providing it's an insult, right? It's a means of of doing it. It's like spitting, right? Like there, there's so self defense is not included in this, right? So those are that. That's how I'd, I'd say this is my own personal vengeance, right? Okay. Yes, Chris. Uh, in my footnotes, there's something that kind of caught caught me or connects with me is it says it is more important to give justice and mercy than to receive it. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. We need to be, be people that pursue justice but we don't have to necessarily claim what's just i mean you could you could say look it's just for me to have to to be repaid back for that and but what christ is saying you don't have we don't have to take that stance god knows so that's where mercy that's where mercy comes in expecting what what we deserve back as yeah. restitution you give mercy on it and you're you're letting it go 
And do you know what? I mean, I don't know how many of you've had situations like that where you've been wronged by someone and that's hurt deeply. If you are engaged in trying to have retributive justice, I'm going to get them back. What does that do to your soul? Poison. Poison. Like it just eats you up until you actually, and then guess what? Once you've done it, you feel any better? No. Hey, every once in a while in the action, you're like, you know, yeah, some people might feel better, but guess what? You haven't done anything to your soul to improve that. You've done damage to that because that's what that kind of, that's what that, that type of anger that he started out with about anger at the very beginning, the law of murder. So there is a release that can happen, even emotional release is saying, I'm not worried about that. God's got me. I'm going to, it's fine. I'd rather be wronged let my brother take the money. I'm just going to let go. God's got me. Right? One of these days, I'm going to get that back in space in eternity anyway. Right? So there is a, there's a way to release that stuff that I think is actually just not only just spiritually uh, beneficial, but just is uh, emotionally healthy. Or even better yet, the person that wrong to you finds Christ and seeks forgiveness. Yeah. And you meet him in heaven. There's a there's a story. You everyone know Corey Ten Boom? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well you know the story then about the uh, prison guard that killed her sister in the Nazi concentration camps. That's pretty hard to love that person. I mean it's pretty hard to love the Nazis anyway for what they did, but to see them brutalize everybody and then brutalize your own sibling and kill them. You have every right to be angry. She had every right to be like, look, if I never see a German prison guard again in my life, I it wouldn't be too soon, right? But the story is that she met the prison guard after the war and she loved that prison guard to Christ. So it's, yes. So to your point, that prison guard expected what out of her? Probably to be assaulted. If I'm the prison guard, I'm thinking, she's going to be super angry and she's probably going to try to kill me or something else. And yet, what did she receive? She received love. So there is a sense in which God can use that as a, uh, as it means, you're not adding evil upon evil, you're actually bringing some good there. Yes, Mike. I just wanted to make this comment. Uh, I've seen all uh, eight episodes of season four of The Chosen. Yeah. And uh, they use the uh, the one verse in there, uh, I believe it's uh, 41, uh, where Jesus says, if a soldier asks you to carry his bags a mile, carry them too. Yeah. And uh, the response is just wonderful. I'm not going to expo uh, expose it, but it was really, um, yeah, really heartfelt. So when you guys all watch the chosen uh, the new season coming out, um, I think you're really going to enjoy it. Yeah, and I, um, I can just say one of the things. You now again, I'm not asking, I'm not advocating for people to go out and allow themselves to be abused or hurt or whatever else. Um, so don't misunderstand my statement. In early Christianity. The biggest witness that the early church had that resulted in the eventual Christianization of the world and the known world at the time was what? Does anyone know? It was, was the response of the Christians to persecution. They were ridiculed by the Romans. The Romans said, look what we do to these people. And guess what? They love us back. When someone does them wrong, they just love them back. Like, what type of people do that type of thing? And that was a witness to the world of what a righteous person, the impact that they can have. That was actually more important to the early Christianization of the world than just about anything else. It was the response of Christians when the world persecuted them, how did they respond back? Not eye for an eye, but an eye for love. 
Now, again, I'm not asking us to you know, someone go out there and throw yourself to the lines or whatever else, but I am saying there is a there is a witness to your point. There is a witness to the world when we act differently than the world expects. Now, Fruit and Bomb said that. Uh... And we got to. We know theology. Yeah. But we don't apply it. Yeah. This world would be a whole different place if we took that faith that we supposedly have and knowing who God is and all the miracles he's done and gave us his only son. If we truly believe that, we would be out there. We wouldn't be sitting here. We would be out there trying to tur turn the world to Christ. Yeah. And it would be a whole different place. All right. Uh, with that said, um, we are way over, way over time. Um, so would anyone like to close? Anyone like to close in prayer for tonight? Anybody? All right, Mike. Take, Lord, take us home. Lord, thank you for our gathering here tonight and, uh, and uh, allowing us to partake in this. Uh, we don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be here. And uh, you've really given us uh, a lot of grace uh, these past months, going on years, with Randall's teaching. He's been an absolute, uh, wonderful, peaceful, full of grace teacher for us and a light for you, Lord. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to have this study in his teaching. Grant us grace, Lord. Grant us grace, though we don't deserve it. Help us to be closer to you, because without you, we're nothing. Help us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, because truly, it starts with love, and it's definitely supernatural. To err is human, forgive divine. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, everyone. We will see you next week. That your team on the floor there? I'm still not getting emails. So I'll... Thank you.